All right, what's up everybody? John the Morgal here, checking in for another new video for you. Hope you do enjoy it. So, getting right into it. Um, but so, in these strange times of uncertainty and persistent fear porn, meaningful reassurance that some intelligent, hopefully benevolent force is in control of this realm is necessary, for it is necessarily true. At times, it is difficult to recognize the signature of the Most High from our cloudy and misguided perspective, especially from within the fake space paradigm. I thank God for that particular revelation. So, according to standard imaginary physics and related confounded speculations, the entire universe was created by accident and from essentially nothing. And the creative force responsible for transmuting a hypothetical speck of matter into the infinite, ever-expanding universe was essentially chaos. So the accident of spontaneous slash anomalous creation is covered by scientism with the Big Bang Theory, with very little supporting evidence which can be tangibly examined to support or disprove such theories, which are presented as a pig with so much lipstick and as science. The circumstantial evidence which is presented as proof uh, of such absurd theories is only ever filtered through the lens of ball earth mania, which begins and ends with the unquestionable assumption that the world must be a spinning ball housed within the infinite vacuum of space. Uh, such doctrines are preached ubiquitously by the religion of scientism to the youngest captive audiences possible, giving rise to the largest cult in the world to be sure. So from the standpoint of a typical disciple of scientism, the concept of the fixed and immovable world described in the beginning of the Torah and practically all ancient sources is by default completely laughable as the concept of anything but a spinning ball earth is instantly rejected as ridiculous, absurd. So the fact that this concept happens to be the obvious and demonstrable truth isn't even considered. Uh, growing up in a Christian setting, such major conflicts between the doctrines of scientism and the doctrines of said religious systems became apparent due to the deception and cultural manipulation via the media within which we were all raised. The default win goes to the impeccable clergy of scientism. So if the sparse few people who are cognitively astute and concerned enough to recognize such incompatibilities of the two threads simply choose to ignore the ancient goat herders of the Fertile Crescent altogether. The fools who thought the earth was flat and stationary, of course, who would ever listen to them? So the modern automaton will concur with the infallible wisdom owned and controlled by the ecclesiastical pontificates of theory. Ironically, this is true for most modern Christians as well. These upper clergymen of scientism will promise us that certain concepts which can never be demonstrated or verified are a practical certainty. For example, if a theoretician claims that a certain star is three billion light years away, uh, it's all based on complicated algorithms which are far too involved for the layman to comprehend. The starting point for the metrics used to guesstimate stellar distances or astronomical units is anything but science. Really, what it was, basically, it was all sorts of wild guesses agreed upon by men and ultimately deemed dogma in order to pretend that we have a fair handle on the universe. And uh, check out a previous video in regards to the speed of light. I'll try to remember to put a card here and a link at the end. So... Anyway, not to get into the weeds, but the story explaining how the antiquated and ill-equipped lientific joggernauts of yesteryear calculated the distance to the plane ets, as well as the speed of light itself, they used what are technically called wild guesses as a baseline, which eventually morph into a concrete, carved in stone, scientifically factual wild guess, which must never be questioned or disproven, lest the entire theoretical system falls apart like a house of cards, along with all of its perfectly correct mathematical extrapolations which have absolutely no relation to actuality. In a nutshell, in order to guess the speed of light by timing the eclipses of the Jupiter's moon low, this guy named Romer estimated that light would take about 22 minutes to travel a distance equal to the diameter of Earth's orbit around the Sun. First, Romer had to take a wild guess in terms of the distance to Jupiter. Keep in mind, any number could have been given for this wild guess, which his wild guess happened to be very close to what is accepted as scientific fact to this very day. I suppose Romer's middle name was Lucky. 
<clears throat> either through stroke of genius, luck, or mere convenience to the matrix that we have today, Romer's wild guess estimate to the distance to Jupiter to conduct his so-called experiment was close enough to roughly guess the speed of light if and only if his wild stab-in-the-dark distance to Jupiter was, you know, close to accurate. His conclusions were essentially accepted as close enough with some minor adjustments later on to correct the scientifically accurate, haphazard, hypothetical metric called the astronomical unit, and even the meter or the kilometer is contingent upon the agreed-upon speed of light, all based on Romer's wild guesses, believe it or not. At any rate, the entire basis for which the so-called scientists claiming the distance of some star as being three billion light years away is thus described. <clears throat> the geniuses of our era are systemically pigeonholed into such fields, fields of so-called science which enjoy perpetual correctness due to immunity from demonstrability or falsifiability, repeatability, or even tangibility. It is certainly a beautiful climate for imaginary theorists who have developed a highly complex model which, in fact, has no relation to reality, but will never be verified or falsified by any tangible or practical means or experiment. It's not as if your average person has the ability to test the assertions postulated by the likes of Romer and verifudged by the likes of NASA. Ergo, we cannot possibly call hypothetical distances to stars, for example, science. For the very nature of science demands repeatable observability and demonstrability of a given claim for it to be acceptable science. When you introduce some concept as scientific, yet not one single person in the world has the ability to verify the concept, it is quite the opposite of science. If such a thing has a name, it is then scientism. Of course, you could trust NASA, who has been caught bold-faced lying about practically everything they've ever claimed, since the very embryonic stages of their existence and even the existence of their precursors. Why would you trust known liars, right? Uh, so the entire basis for mainstream abandonment of the obvious truths taught by all ancient cultures are founded upon so-called scientific facts, which are exactly hypothetical ponderings supported by fancy mathematics which fall apart if certain unquestionable axioms are at least ever questioned if only for argument's sake or for the sake of inquiry, which is, of course, the entire purpose of the scientific method in the first place. Upon the utter and irreparable revelation regarding the actual shape and nature of the world, it becomes clear that the simple wisdom enshrined in the doctrine of many ancient cultures is not to be cast aside for some imaginary verse vomited forth from the hypothetical theorists. Upon this key revelation, it becomes clear that any reactionary rejection of ancient and obvious truth is revealed to be a grave error, for there are important physical and spiritual lessons within the pages of ancient traditions all over the world. The sociological quagmire that we find ourselves in can arguably be attributed to the fact that our culture has been utterly indoctrinated into the religion of scientism, which has infested and infected the minds of all and somehow supersedes the timeless wisdom found in the ancient teachings from all over the world. From the perspective of the average normie, the concept of an intelligent creator is simply absurd. The religious scientific doctrine decrees that the universe was created by accidental coincidence, and the major factor responsible for the creation of life was essentially lucky chance. Their doctrines dictate that before life existed, the surface of the plain et was covered with some totally hypothetical brew dubbed the primordial ooze. This primordial ooze was no more alive than a glass of chocolate milk, although hypothetically possessed the a perfect combination of proteins or amino acids to spontaneously transform by some hypothetical mechanism which will dare say never be demonstrated in a lab into a living single-celled organism. This means that, by accidental happenstance, some random fluids metamorphosized into the complex, intelligent code called DNA. DNA is essentially software or coded information which integrates with biological hardware made of very simple materials like water and carbon and salt, right? By some miraculous and mysteriously conceived nanotech, for lack of a better phrase, these so-called simplex organisms are ready to evolve into all the life that ever existed or will exist on the planet. Amazing capabilities 
are available in these little single-celled organisms, these little living dynamos like you know, self-replication, self-repair, and other complex functions which all came into being by accident, by mistake. These amazing microscopic organisms come complete with their own self-contained blueprints, which are copied over to new generations of cells, all thanks to a completely automated process showcasing the perfect and unparalleled marriage between intelligently designed software and exquisitely simplex building materials, hardware, which become more and more complex over time in a situation created by chaos. Hmm. Such an astonishingly effective marriage of an operating system, installation files which literally organize physical material according to encoded genetic blueprints stored within. This first series of accidentally written, copied, and encoded works of programming excellence beyond measure or comparison was conveniently and accidentally written in such a way that the code could be self-modified or self-updated by some natural process called evolution. In this theory, the DNA, which spontaneously manifests itself by coincidence, could be autonomously upgraded to support new hardware-software combo forms, increasingly complex multifaceted systems, all the way up to the human eye, the human brain, the vocal cords, all thanks to Lady Serendipity. And of course, let's not forget the chaotic guiding force called natural selection. In this further extrapolation of hypothetical history, the physical law of entropy is thus violated. That is to say that complex, organized systems, if left to natural, chaotic forces, will always deteriorate into less organized systems and will never become more and more complex as time goes by. So the mainstream narrative expects us to swallow this entirely unbelievable shtick involving complex, perfect, and marvelous code as so described, which randomly manifests itself from the accidental soup and haphazardly wrote code by accident, which still exists in all living organisms which have DNA, which is to say, pretty much all living organisms. <clears throat> the entire concept can be likened to finding a laptop computer in the desert and assuming that the laptop magically manifests itself from the sand and accidentally wrote the software to support the operating system. To practically extend this analogy, the laptop would, upon starting it up, begin to self-replicate copies of the laptop, physical hardware and software contained within, Quite frankly, this hypothesis involving the laptop is more believable than the mainstream theory of spontaneous and accidental creation of the universe, let alone the spontaneous and accidental creation of the mystery of life. And of course, we know for a fact that the laptop must have been created as the result of some form of intelligent design, right? Including the physical hardware of plastic and the alloys. In some sense, the spontaneous or accidental creation of life is more believable since the building materials involved are found naturally, unlike plastics or refined metals or alloys comprising the laptop in the desert. Of course, the software found in a computer is light years behind the code found in DNA. While the software code in a laptop was clearly created by an intelligent designer, we're expected to believe that the wildly superior DNA hardware slash software combo simply manifests itself from random chemical reactions of such have never been demonstrated in a lab under controlled settings, and we already have the end result to start with, so we're not shooting in the dark like the inanimate soup and uh, Lady Serendipity were, right? So the argument that it could have occurred by accident if given it enough time, which you will hear, is tantamount to saying that you could perfectly spell out a novel by throwing vats of SpaghettiOs against a wall enough times. It's just absurd. Of course, the hypothetical primordial ooze is makeup. Perhaps its very existence are entirely theoretical. So even if some type of demonstration of this theory is one day achieved, a practically impossible achievement, it will not necessarily correlate to actual conditions as they existed in the theoretical ooze of flawless, accidental coding skills. The complex genetic code found in all life forms is proof positive of the existence of an intelligent creator. There is no plausible reason to believe that an indescribably complex and ingenious example of random, chaotic, accidental forces could possibly organize themselves into such a flawless and complex system which can self-modify its hardware, update its software via a process called natural selection, which molds the existing organism into something entirely different over many generations. 
Jones. Now, it is claimed that some ancient aquatic animal, quote-unquote, evolved into some snakish salamander or frog and then somehow made the leap to other creatures and ultimately to the larger and more intelligent apex predators. Nothing in nature or in the fossil record suggests or supports this theory of evolution. Uh, two specimens of a species will always give birth to another specimen of the exact species. Uh, surely, certain traits can be manipulated by specific breeding practices or environmental variables. So you can have lots of varieties of dogs, which can vary wildly in terms of outward appearance. Uh, however, even a chihuahua can mate with a German Shepherd. Regardless of this disparity between the two dogs, uh, they will always give birth to another dog. Uh, it's theorized that dogs, quote-unquote, evolved from wolves, but of course, there are no known examples of wolves giving birth to dogs. Of course, the leap from wolves to dogs seems at least plausible, uh, more so than single-celled organisms to people or salamanders to chickens or something, I don't know, but um, wolves to dogs is not a huge leap, although uh, not in the vehicle of evolution, rather through the process of gene expression. Uh, gene expression is an observable phenomenon which can relatively quickly, in some cases, change the physical attributes and uh, mental prowess of creatures. Uh, for example, if you let a domesticated pig loose into the wild, they will, within a few weeks, drastically morph into a wild boar. Uh, not only does their outward appearance change, but their behavioral patterns take a total 180 in many cases. Uh, anyone who's ever met a domesticated pig knows they're probably better than owning a porcupine, and certainly are at least on par with dogs when it comes to loyalty and an overall lovable nature. Well, we have to be talking about one charming my pig. Right, unfortunately, the same cannot be said about our friends of the feline variety, who are about as loyal as a pack of starving hyenas. Okay, so stereotypes can be unfair, but the loyal cats are few and far between. And even they are temperamental at times. There is, however, a tenuous similarity between cats and pigs, believe it or not, in a sense that cats will indeed go feral if removed from their customary environment. Of course, they don't go through such a drastic physical metamorphosis as the pig, but they will change in countenance, which will, you know, indirectly affect their cosmetic appearance, but there is a parallel to be drawn there. At any rate, the fact that the revelations we've been experiencing, as promised, is proof of the Most High Creator's wisdom and sense of humor, I would say, and the fact that we're even sitting here talking about it also goes as far. So uh, that wraps this one up. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Love you much. Uh, see you in the next video.